Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Torah Studies. This week, Parshas Koirach, the portion of Koirach, about the story of Koirach, we all know the one who started a fight against Moses. The topic of today's class is different yet equal. We are all the same is tempting but it's also premature. What does that mean? We're going to get into it. You know, in today's day and age, people talk a lot about equality. People want to be the same. And equal rights, which is a very, sounds like a very noble idea. Everyone should be treated the same. That is absolutely true. Where is it coming from? Where, did, where is the source of people, the the concept of equality, we actually go back, way back to the Torah itself, in the very beginning of the Torah, in Genesis. We read about, we'll see inside, in Genesis, the concept of equality, where does it come from? We see right in the beginning in Genesis, the Torah says, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. People are created in the image of God himself. And what that means is that we are all in the same image. And as a matter of fact, it says even the male and female were created first as one, and then Hashem separated us. And the question is, if we are all created in the same image, then what happened to all of our differences? Why are we all so different? We all have different way of thinking. We come with different tribes and different backgrounds and different classes and different a way of uh, the way we perceive things, different trades, different talents. The multiplicity of people is so vast. There must be a purpose for it. So we're going to get into this what it means truly equal. And we're going to go in first by first going in, delving into the story of this week's Torah portion, the story of Koirach. So Koirach started a dispute against Moses, against Moshe Rabbeinu. Now you can imagine Moshe Rabbeinu, he was the ultimate, the greatest leader of all time. He took the Jews out of Egypt with the plagues that he brought upon them with, uh, by the directions of God, of course. And he takes them out. He gave, leads them to, through the, the splitting of the sea. The people go out and they come and they go. They, they are saved, spared from the wrath of the Egyptian army. They come and they come out of the sea with all of the fortune that they took from Egypt. They get into, Moshe Rabbeinu takes them to Mat and Torah to receive the Torah, the Ten Commandments, they come down, the godly revelation. Moshe Rabbeinu then goes up to the, to, to the mountain for 40 days, and sure enough, when he comes back, what does he see? The Jews messed up. It was the it was the Eir of Rav, the people who those Egyptians who joined the Jewish people that caused all of the troubles. But in, either way, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And Hashem wanted to destroy everyone. And Moshe Rabbeinu stands in the way and he saves them. And he goes back to Hashem and he asks, begs for forgiveness. 120 days altogether, he was there in the mountain. Finally, Hashem forgives them, gives them Yom Kippur. That was that was the day Moshe Rabbeinu came down on Yom Kippur. 
told him Hashem forgave them all. And they go on. And again and again, there was other things. And finally, with the story with the spies that we learned last week. So after all of this, you see that the great leader, Koirach, comes and he says, wait a sec. Why Moshe Rabbeinu? Why you? Why, the, why your family? We want them all equal. We want to be the same. And of course, we know this was this ended up not very well. Ended up in a big disaster. Kairach and all of his people, they passed away. They died. But it wasn't just a regular dying. It was the earth opened up and it swallowed them alive. So that's what we see inside. Hashem says to Moshe, he tells him, speak to the congregation saying, withdraw from the dwelling of Kairach, Dasan, and Aviram. And the earth beneath them opened its mouth and swallowed them and their houses and all the men who were with Kairach and all the property. So this was Kairach and his people. Then there was something else also. There were 250 people who were the leaders that also joined Koirach. They have had a different type of death. As the Torah says, the Eishiyatzameis Hashem, a fire came forth from God and consumed the 250 men who had offered up the incense. So, of course, what happened there, the Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu told them, if you want to see, you want to see if it, it was my decision to, de- to decide who is, an, who is in charge, who is on top, who is the leader, who is the Kohen, the priest, or was it God? And he told them, you want to bring your offering of the incense, which was a special, special offering that only the Kohens do. And let's see. And let's see if you survive it. And they and they did it. And he told them that if if you're not worthy, you're not gonna you're not gonna last. You're not gonna survive. Now, what is interesting here? What we need to understand: what is it about these two ways, these two types of punishment? We know that in general, it says that Hashem, God does mida keneged mida, measure for measure. So when there is a punishment, you got to find a way, a reason why the punishment is a measure for the, for the crime, for the sin. So we need to understand what is the connection between these two punishments, the, the swallowing of the people, the ground swallowed them up, and the fact that uh, the other people that they were burned in the fire. There must be a, a, an explanation, must be a reason. And this is, in fact, the uh, Abar Banel is asking this question. This is uh, so question number one. Why did God see it as necessary? So there are two different types of punishment. Question number two is what is the connection between being burned or swallowed in the earth and the sin of the rebellion against Moses and Aaron? And this is what the Babanel is asking. Why did Moses pray for the earth to open up and swallow them and not for the fire to burn them? That's another question he's asking. And also, and why did he see fit to pray for the earth to open up and swallow them, what connection is there between this punishment and the sin? And as we said before, this is Midah Keneged. Midah Hashem does measure for measure. So so one of the possible answers that brings Rabbi Bachia, he says as follows, 
God matches the punishment to the crime. It says, Koirach wanted a high position that he didn't deserve. Therefore, he was punished by being relegated to a position below the earth. Okay. Then Koirach was the prototype of all those who arrogantly and inappropriately seek lofty positions. And the punishment by fire was also measure for measure, says the Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Bachia. He says, why? Because the 250 who were also firstborns, okay, they had offered incense, which was a privilege they hadn't earned. So being, so that's what he says, basically the idea of being burned because they offered fire, they offered the incense, and that's why they were burned. So this is a, a, it's a, it's a nice explanation, but it still doesn't answer really. And we understand that the concept of going down is like the swallow, the, the, you're going into the ground, but the, we find that the swallowing, what is the meaning of swallowing? There must be something deeper. It doesn't explain why they were, sw they were swallowed into the ground in particular. So to understand this, we need to first understand what, what did he want? What exactly did Kerech want? What bothered him? So we read in the Torah exactly what, what his complaint was. So it says like this. Then Kerech took himself aside together with Dasan and Aviram and on Ben Pelef, these people these men together with 250 of the nation's reputable chieftains, they confronted Moses. The CAA decree and They surrounded Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have taken too much greatness for yourself, for yourselves. This whole nation is holy and God is among us all. So why should you rise above God's congregation? Okay. So what did he want? He wanted equality. Kairach's goal with this outcry was to raise the banner of utter equality. So what was wrong about this? He wanted equality. He wanted everybody to be the same. And yet he becomes like the, the, the archetype of, of, of machloikas. You know, whenever you want to say someone who is making trouble, is making fights, and said, this is your, your koirach. All he wanted is equality. Everybody should be the same. So what was wrong with that? We find, Rav said, this says the Gemara, that one who is involved in a, in a quarrel transgresses a negative precept, as it says, one should not be like Koirach and his congregation. Okay, that's it. You do something bad, you're like Koirach. And that is the Rabbi is asking, the how could a demand for unity among Jews result in dispute? And how could the dispute be so polarizing that, that it becomes a prototype for every quarrel among Jews forever after? So whenever there is a quarrel, they say, ah, oh, this is Kairach again. What was so bad about this? So the answer we really we can find in the reply that Moses replied to Kairach. What does the Torah say? He spoke, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to Kairach and to all of his people. He said to him, In the morning God will make known who is his. 
Vesakodesh ve'ikriv elov. And who is holy, and he will draw them near to him. And the one he chooses, he will draw near to him. So what is he saying? So, uh, sounds like a simple, it, it tells them, Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, wait until the morning, the morning will find the answer. God will bring a sign. He will show who is right and who is wrong. But Rashi says that there is a, there's, there's something deeper in here. He says this word, Hashem. in the morning, God will make known. Says Rashi, that there is a message here. What is the message? The message Rashi says that God set certain boundaries in the world that cannot be blurred. There is a boundary. Baker, there is morning and there is night. Just like Hashem makes boundaries between the morning and night, Hashem makes boundaries between people. And those boundaries are boundaries that are good boundaries. Boundaries that Hashem set are important. That's what Rashi says. Moshe. Moses said to Kairach, God assigned boundaries to his, to his world. Are you able to transform morning into evening? Doing so is as impossible as it would be for you to undo this separation. As the verse states, it was evening and it was morning. And Hashem separated and he separated. God separated between the evening and the morning. So he said to him, similarly, it says, Aaron was set apart to sanctify him. Hashem set apart Aaron to sanctify Aaron that he should be the one to represent the Jewish people. Every person, everything has a, a, a purpose in this world. You have night and you have morning. Together, they make up a day. If you're going to mix them up, it's not going to do good. It's only going to confuse everything. It's only going to bring chaos. Okay? However, there must be a lot more to Kairach's desire and Moshe's response. When we will understand the depth of it, we will understand also why these two punishments came to them. But to begin this, to understand this, let's begin with the Mishnah that we read in the Perkei Avot that talks about the creation of the world, that Hashem created the world with 10 utterances. Those of you who listen to the Tanya here will be familiar with this, as we spoke this, about this these few days, that the 10 utterances are the source of creation of the entire world. It says, Ba'asarama Amoris Nivra Eilam, the world was created with 10 utterances. What does this teach? For surely it could have been created with one utterance. This was in order to punish the wicked who destroyed the world that was created with 10 utterances and to give good reward to the righteous who maintained the world that was created with 10 utterances. So what are we talking about, the ten utterances? What is about the one utterance? What does that mean? What is this all about? The ten utterances, we're talking about what it says in the beginning of uh, the Torah in Bereshis. Bereshis bara lakim, in the beginning God created. It says, vayomer lakim yihor, Hashem said, let there be light. Hashem said, let there be a firmament. And all these things that Hashem said. 
And in Tanya, we learned today, in the last, that was in the, in the first chapter, in the 12th chapter of this part of the Tanya, the second part of Tanya, Shar Yichud Ve'emunah, the Alter Rebbe explains how those utterances are the source of the energy that every single creature receives. So there are things that are mentioned in the Torah clearly in the 10 utterances, in like, let it be light or let it be rakia, the firmament, the sky. And then there is every single creature that has it, that, that exists in this world has its holy name, the name in the holy tongue and the Hebrew name. And that name of that thing, the letters of that name is the source of the energy of that particular creature. That is why Adam, Marisha, and Adam was able to name the animals, each animal. That was a great thing. He was naming the animals. What's, a, what's such a big deal of naming animals? The answer is because he really didn't just pick names arbitrarily. He knew that the that that uh, chamor is chet mem vav reish, and those letters chamor is the source of energy to this particular animal. So when he saw an animal, he saw, oh, I see the source, I see the energy. This is the sarama amarot, the ten utterances that God created. Which means, Hashem created the world. He created it with a multiplicity of different creations. There's animals, there's trees, there is people. There's all kinds of differences. And all of them create a harmony that each particular creature, nothing was created in vain. That says, Kol Hashem did not create a single thing in vain. Do we understand why a leaf is on the tree and why it falls off? We don't understand. But Hashem does have a reason for each individual creature why it is there. Now, what did Koyach want? Koyach understood this. He understood the importance of the multiplicity but he also understood what it says, the world could have been created in what one utterance. What is the one utterance? It is the concept that Hashem is above everything. And when it comes to holiness, we are all can be included into the holiness of Hashem. Now to understand this, what, what this means, There are different ways of understanding how the different, the multiplicity can become united. We are here, we are different, and yet we are equal. Yet we are, each one has a way to complete one another. And there are different ways that we can, we can come. In Kabbalah, it mentions about the world in three categories. There is the Oilam, Shana, and Nefesh. Oilam means world, which basically means space. Shana means year, which basically means time. And Nefesh means the soul, the individual. Now, in the Rebbe brings out that in all of these in all of these three categories, we can find that Hashem set in the world, Hashem set the separations. He set the separations in Olam, in space. Where do we see that Hashem set in a separation in space? This is in the level of holiness in space. The Mishnah says about 10 levels of holiness in space, in certain areas that are holier than others. Let's see it inside the way the Mishnah says. It 
So each place in the land of Israel has its own contribution to the greater collective purpose. Says the Mishnah here, there are 10 grades of holiness and the land of Israel is holier than all other lands. Cities that are walled are holier than the rest of Israel. The area within the wall of Jerusalem is holier than the walled cities. The Temple Mount is even holier. The Chayl, Chayl is a part of the Temple Mount behind, behind, beyond a certain fence, is even holier. The court of the woman is even holier. The court of the Israelites is even holier. The court of the priests is even holier. The area between the, po the porch, the ulam, and the altar is even holier. The Heichal, the sanctuary, is even holier. The holy of holies is the holiest of all. For only the high priest, on Yom Kippur, at the time of service, may enter it. So here, we really have the separation of the levels of the holiness in all three categories. You have it in Oilam, in, in space, which is Yerushalayim, and the Kodesh HaKadoshim, ultimately the holiest of all. You have in time, which is the day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. So time-wise, Hashem also separated time. There's different levels in time. You have mundane days, you have Chol Moed, the days between the Yom Tov, then you have Yom Tov, then you have Shabbat. Yom Kippur is the, is the utmost, the ultimate holiest day of the year. And the same thing is also with people, with individuals. Hashem separated and said, they are the people, they are Kohanim, they are Levites, and they are Israelites, different levels of people. And Hashem separated the Kohen. Vekidashto, you should sanctify the Kohen. And the, among the Kohens, you have also the high priest. The high priest is the holiest of all. He's the one and only. You can only have one high priest at a time. You cannot have two. And he's the only one who is allowed into the Holy of Holies on the holiest year. So this is what we have. We have in time. There are weekdays, Chalamoed, Shabbat, Yom Tov, and ultimate the Yom Kippur. And you have in the individual. Jews are divided into Kohanim, Levites, and Israelites, and are further divided into many specific levels. This says also in Chayte Veitzecha, Shayev Memecha, the Torah does recognize that there are different levels. But that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Yes, the level that Hashem separate them, and it gives them a certain task, but each individual has their task. And we'll soon see what and how the different levels of uniting, the different levels of uniting the different categories. So level number one, how do you unite how do you get together? How do you understand how we can be united is tolerance and respect. When you recognize, you tolerate, you tolerate what the other person represents and you respect his place, that is that you have peace. Each one understands, and each one recognizes what he is good for, what his position is, and that's how you have peace. You don't get, you don't over, you don't step over the other person. And the same thing is also in the spiritual sense. We are all different, but we can show respect to each other. Each of us contributes something unique. That's one step, one level of, of unity. You have another level of unity, even a greater, when you realize 
that each one can learn from one another. And they, they, can, they can not only that you tolerate, but each one contributes to the other as well. For example, we know the Kohen. The Kohen is separated, is elevated. Hashem elevated the Kohen, but Hashem instructs the Kohen to bless the people. He needs to bless the people, he needs to give from his to the other. But it really works both ways. Not only does the Kohen bless the people, the Torah says, Vekidashto. And you should sanctify him, meaning that the co- that the person that the, reg- the Israelite by him sanctifying the Kohen also adds to the Kedusha, the holiness of the Kohen. Not only that, also the fact that the Kohen blesses, it says, Vani Avorachim. As Hashem says, you bless the people and Hashem blesses you. So by blessing the people, that adds into the Kohen himself. This you have in Nefesh by people. The same idea you can have also in, when we're talking about the different levels, the separation in space. You have some spaces that are holier than others. There too also you have this concept that the the Beis Hamikdash is separated, is higher, but it's not selfish. The Holy Temple it says, "Mimeno oira yitzelakala kulay." The light from the Beis Hamikdash goes and sheds to the entire world. The entire world benefits from the Beis Hamikdash. So this is benefit benefiting from one another. That is a greater level of unity, uniting the lower and the higher, the different levels. As a matter of fact, it says, our sages tell us that if the Goyim would have known what kind of benefit they have from the Holy Temple, not only would they never destroy the Temple, but they would have brought their armies to stand by there and protect the Holy Temple. Wouldn't build an Alexa over there. They would protect us, and one day this will come. So the benefit to so the world benefits from the Beis Hamikdash, but the same thing is for other vice versa. The Beis the Beis Hamikdash also benefits from the people, because who builds the Beis Hamikdash? Who builds the temple? It is the contributions of the people that build the temple. And the same thing is also when we're talking about time. Time is also, as we said, we have the separation of time. Hashem set set up time. You have the weekdays, you have Shabbat, and you have the holy days. Ultimately, you have Yom Kippur. So the Shabbat blesses the rest of the, the rest of the days. So Shabbat, this also, it says Shabbos, it says in the Zoya, Shabbos, my name is Bochim Kuli Yaimin. From the holy day of Shabbos, the rest of the days, the days of the week, are blessed from Shabbos. So this is the level two, learning from one another. Boundaries are necessary, but there must also be a means of connection within those boundaries. Yes, we are different. We have, each one has our unique qualities, but we're learning from one another. One another. But ultimately, the highest level of unity is a unity that we realize not only that do we learn from one another, but we realize that we we are not perfect without everyone involved. Yes, you may be one level, I may be in a lower level in a certain extent than you, but you will not be perfect without me, and I will not be perfect without you. Everyone needs everyone else in order to, to have a perfect harmony and perfect peace. That is a greater level, a deeper level in holiness, in, in unity. For example, 
As the Alter Rebbe brings the example of a body. The body has a head and you have the feet. So which one is greater? Obviously the head, you think, you, you plan, your whole life depends on the head. But is there something the feet can contribute, of course? You cannot play soccer with your head. You need your feet to run. You need to... You, you need to feed the feet to run to shul, to daven. Then the head needs the feet. So this is the concept of unity when we realize not only do we each re respect each, other each other's boundaries, not only do we feel that we benefit from one another, but when we realize that we are nothing we are not as a whole, we look at ourselves as a whole, that we are not perfect without one another, that each one of us perfects the rest. This is the, the third level of unity. This is what the Rebbe says. The highest level of peace, the highest level of unity, is as the Alter Rebbe explains regarding the Jewish people, namely, that we all need each other. And our one body, every limb of the human body has its own particular characteristics and advantage that it contributes to the greater good of the rest of the body. So it is with the greater body of the Jewish people. In the Alter Rebbe's words, this is analogous to a human body from head to toe. The feet are admittedly the end of the body, and the head is the top of and, and supreme part of the body. And yet, in some respects, the feet have an edge over the head, insofar as the head is unable to go anywhere without the feet. The feet also keep the body along with the head upright. Another dynamic is as that demonstrates the interconnectedness of all limbs is the fact that when the head hurts, a shot to the foot can cure the, and bring healing. Or a shot in the arm, a vaccine can affect the entire body. Now, I'm not going to go into the politics of the vaccine now. <laughs> take it whatever you, way you want to take it. But the fact is that every part of the body is interconnected. What emerges is that the head is incomplete without the feet. And so it is with the Jewish people. We are all one body. Okay, so that's the third level of, of, of the unity of the peace. And we're all hands on deck. There are differences, but that means if any attribute were missing, the whole wouldn't be complete. Okay? So this is the, the three levels. However, after explaining all these three levels, we're getting to the ultimate level. Ultimately, there is the level that we are really one. That we are truly, truly one. And the differences that we have is only as we are in this physical world with the physical limitations, with the filtering of this world that brings us out in different ways. But if we look deep into the neshama, if we look deep into the source, ultimately, really, we are truly one. Take, for example, the sunlight. If the sunlight, the sun shines, it can shine through different colors, can have different reflection. You look in the sky, sometimes you say, see a beautiful rainbow. And, but ultimately, all of these different lights that come from one sun. There's one sun, the source is, is one. The source of the neshamas is truly, truly one. And that is true in both 
That is true in the levels of space, time, and, and person. We find it in space. We find it that the Holy of Holies is what? One of the amazing phenomena, we mentioned this a number of times, that in the Holy of Holies, in the Beis Amikdash, it was beyond space. It wasn't just like this was the holiest place on earth, but this was a place that exemplified that the place is beyond space. What does that mean? It was literally that. In the Holy of Holies, we had the Holy Ark, the Arun HaKadosh. And the Ark had its measure. It was two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide. And from each, in the Holy of Holies, measured 20 cubits. And the Ark was right in the center. But when you measured from each side of the Ark to the wall, you found 10 cubits on each side. That means that the Holy Ark took space. It was one and a half cubit by two and a half. And yet it didn't take space because when you measure the room, it was 20. It wasn't 21 and a half. That was the amazing miracle that Hashem showed that is beyond this is the source of space, where it's beyond space. It's not limited. They're all united in one in the source. It's above everything. And the same thing is in the year and time. Yom Kippur is the highest, the holiest. There's only one day of Yom Kippur. It is a day. Why does Yom Kippur forgive? Why all of a sudden when it comes Yom Kippur, everyone is forgiven just like that? It because on that day, we elevate ourselves to a time which is above time. It is above anything that sin can reach. If the sin was affecting in a certain place, and that day we are elevated to a place which is above time. Achas Bashana, one day a year. The day in the year that is connected with the one God. And the same thing is also with the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. The high priest represents, he's the representative of all the Jewish people and he's above them. That is why he alone is allowed to enter the Holy of Holies one day a year. This is the ultimate unity. As we see inside, it says in the Medrash, the Onu Eilonu El Hashem Echad, Teira Achas Mishpat Echad, the Mizbach, Mizbei Echad, the Kohen Gadol Echad. We only have one God, one Torah, one law, one altar, and one high priest. So that's the ultimate level of holiness, realizing that all is one. We seem to be different, yet our, at our core, we are one. And guess what? That's exactly what Kirch was claiming. The Gemara says, Kairach Chachamaya. Kairach was a wise man. What did he see to, need to do this foolishness? What does it mean that he was a wise man? He was a wise man. He understood. He appreciated when after Matan Torah, after realizing the greatness of the people, he understood that Kol Eida Kulam Kedoshim, that all of the people are holy. We are on a very, very high level. Why should you raise yourself about over the, the people of God, the congregation of God? So what did he go wrong? The problem was, Kairach wanted to achieve this level of unity. But this level of unity is a very high spiritual level that... One day the time will come and we will appreciate them. We will live in that level. That is when Mashiach will come. When Mashiach will come, that godliness will be revealed and we will be able to see how we are at the core, we are all one. But until then, we're not ready for that. Now, what happens when you try to introduce a great 
level of holiness into a place where the place is not ready for that. So one of two things can happen. There is the, the higher part of you, the more refined part of you will separate and will go up. We'll not be able to stay to contain in, in this physical limitations. And the other part, that can, the other thing that can happen, which is much worse in a sense, is that part of you that is not yet refined will fall down into the abyss, will fall down very, very low. It will be swallowed by the ground, swallowed into the lowest places that represents the places of the negativity, the places of impurity, where they are nourished from the mistakes of a person that has a godly spark, a godly soul, a Jew. So that is why when a person does something wrong, when a Jew does something wrong, what does it do? It goes down. The neshama goes down to the lowest level. And by him going down, it enables the evil also to nourish from him. This is why what, that's what happened between the people, the 250 people that brought the incense. They, as we said before, they were the greatest, the leaders of the people. They were people who were refined. What happened to them? They were burned in the fire, elevated into the, into the their, their neshamas was elevated to above. They couldn't stay in this physical world. And the other people who were much lower level, Dasan and Aviram, they called them the Rashaim, the wicked people. Along with Kairach, because Kairach caused them also, although he himself was in a higher level. But there's a Midrash that says that Kairach himself also had both. He was burnt and, fall, and swallowed in the ground. Ultimately, we have the ability to elevate. That is the beautiful thing of Teshuva. When we live in this world, and we are able to go step by step and refining, refining the world, making the world a better world. So this is what happens. So Kairach saw through to that deepest level of unity where there is only one. That's what Kairach wanted. But he was mistaken because this can only be exposed when Mashiach arrives, when we are ready for that. So how could, be, how could this be so bad? When people try to achieve a role that isn't in line with the spiritual standing, it pushes them further from the goal. And that is why the two punishments, being burned alive, Refined parts of a person ascend after detaching from the lower levels. That's what happened when they were burned. And being swallowed by the earth, these are the coarser parts of a person who falls more distant from desired spiritual goals. And that is the answer to the questions that we asked. Okay? So we asked, why did God see it ne as necessary to dole out two different types of punishment, because the 250 shiftans sinned on a different levels than the Koirach Dasan and Aviram. Their punishment were in accordance with their respective levels. And the second question, what is the connection between being burned and swallowed in the earth and the sin of the rebellion against Moshe and Aaron? The more refined ones burned up higher, like a fire. And the coarser ones got dragged down like the ashes. And that's what the Rebbe says. We can now understand the connection between the punishment of being burned 
and swallow the life and the crime of division collectively. Collectively. These two punishments demonstrate the consequences of division, departure, and descent. When something burns, the more refined matter of, its, uh, of the item is consumed and goes up. The other elements which cannot be consumed and taken on high are destroyed through the punishment of being plunged into the ground. For this reason, the element of swallowing is featured prominently. This is a reference to the high energy that exists in the lower levels that become susceptible to being swallowed into the negative forces when the boundaries come down. So, and, and this is the lesson what we take. The lesson what we take is God created us in different ways. But that doesn't make, it, make us less important. It makes us that we have to think of how we can come in harmony together and express each individual unique qualities. These qualities that God gifted men Qualities that God gifted women. Qualities that God gifted different type of people. Don't go mad if you don't see. You cannot do like what the other person does. Realize the gift that God gave you. If you have fire and water, fire and water do not, do not coexist. The water will extinguish the fire. But if you put the water in a pot and you put it on the fire, it will bring you a delicious hot cup of coffee or tea. You got to find, you got to realize what is your special quality? What is your special boundary? There's Jews and there's non-Jews. Each one, we have their own, our own mission in the world. And by respecting one another, by realizing how we can benefit from one another, how we can uh, help one another, we make this world into a beautiful, beautiful world. A world of harmony. And then when we have this beautiful world of harmony, that leads to the beautiful world of Mashiach. Then we will truly realize, we will truly realize that our source, the source is that we are truly one in the essence, which is the Neshama. Let us hope that this will happen very, very soon. Thank you so much for joining. Take now. And don't forget to share this and join us in the morning for the Tanya share. Thank All you, everybody. It was wonderful. You're very welcome.